everyone to think. Do you have a wild outlandish dream? Something that you're like, that is just crazy, but if I did that, how awesome would it be? And think about that, talk about that, dream about that, and talk about it when you go home to your friends and your family. So today I am going to talk about our overnight success that has taken more than nine years and share a few lessons that we've learned along the way. Firstly, to share that it's possible and secondly, to share that it's hard. These are the two most important things that I've learned that could possibly equip you for the time and journey ahead. So firstly, it's possible. I learned this when I met Lars Rasmussen who co-founded Google Maps. And I was sitting across from the table from him and I realized he's just a regular person. He, for some reason in my head, was this crazy alien from another planet that had created something incredibly, insanely out of this world. And the secondly, it's hard because it's meant to be. When I started Canva, we had no idea of the incredible journey and the incredibly hard things that we'd have to do along the way. And when we were getting rejected and when we were failing and things weren't going out in the way that we wanted, we thought that it was just us. But actually realizing that every single entrepreneur goes through those same challenges is such an important and powerful thing to learn. So it's been pretty, a pretty long journey. I um, was at university a while ago now. So I'd had a company for a couple of years. So I must have been about 21, something like that. And I was teaching design programs and thought they were really complicated and that in the future they should all be online and collaborative and a lot simpler. Um, but this was when I was 19 and I had no business experience or product experience or marketing experience or like literally any relevant experience whatsoever. And so I started um, creating school yearbooks in Australia. So we created a platform so schools could create them. Um, and that went really well and we started to launch and then yeah it was a, a pretty long journey ended up meeting an investor um, who flew over from Silicon Valley and he said if I went came here I would, he'd meet with me and um, I did. So my journey began when I was at university and I was teaching design programs part-time and students would struggle learning these programs that were really really complex it would take a whole semester for students just to learn the very basics and I realized that in the future it was going to be completely different it was all going to be online and collaborative and really simple. But not only are these programs really difficult and complex, they have to go and do this crazy complex system. So you go and purchase Adobe, then you study design for a few years, then you purchase and download stock photos from a stock photography library. This is to design anything, presentations, pitch decks, social media graphics, anything that looks professional. And then you finally, you finally prepare that design for web or print. So this crazy process is insanely complex and completely doesn't utilize the technology that we have available. And so we thought we'd integrate the entire design ecosystem and make it really, really simple. And so rather than have people having to go into all these different programs, they could just go into one platform and have the entire system at their fingertips. So we'd have a stock photography library that anyone could go and access. We'd have a font library, a layout library, and everyone, even if you've had absolutely no design experience, could design that beautiful presentation or pitch deck or social media graphics. So this was our vision. Grand, grand vision for changing the world of design. But the reality was, I was a university student, I was 19, and I had absolutely no business experience or marketing experience or product experience or any experience that would be somewhat relevant to creating a world-changing company. And so rather than trying to take on the entire world of design when we had no experience, we decided to take on a niche market. So we enabled school yearbooks in Australia to create um, amazing yearbooks online so we could have the entire school collaborating and creating that yearbook online. We used to wear suits to absolutely everything because um, we thought it was very um, businessy. <laughs> yeah, so he was in Perth and I met him at a conference and we had a five minute chat and um, he said, yeah, if I went to Silicon Valley, he'd meet with me. And so I jumped on a plane to Silicon Valley. Actually, and as a result of that conference, I met Bill Tai, who was an investor from over in Silicon Valley. And we had a five minute conversation. And he said, if I went to Silicon Valley, he'd be happy to invest. And so I jumped on a plane to Silicon Valley six months later and presented the future of publishing. 
At this stage, we thought raising funds is going to be a walk in the park. We've built a profitable company, we've grown like crazy, we've been able to expand internationally, we've been, been able to build a product, going to Silicon Valley, getting investment, it's going to be a cinch. That was unfortunately totally not the case. So we were just faced with a wall of problems and rejections and questions. Everything from who cares to I don't understand your industry, it's too ambitious, so it's not ambitious enough, it's too niche. Um, you're the same as some random company we've never heard of. It scares me. Are you just a talker? I don't know you from a bar of soap. This constant, constant rejection. And so what I thought I would do right now is share with you a note that I wrote to myself. A very low moment from back in 2011. And so this was when we were trying, I was in San Francisco for three months and I was trying to find a technical co-founder. It was a year later that we actually found one. But I was going to so many conferences and going to so many different things and just facing rejection after rejection after rejection. And it's not that nice. In fact, I think the sane reaction to rejection is to stop being rejected. But if you are an entrepreneur or if you are trying to achieve something big, you just keep on pushing through and keep on trying and trying and trying and doing something at breakfast, lunch and dinner and going to every conference under the sun. So, this is the note that I wrote to myself. Mel, you're extremely tired. You are in a challenging situation, though you can pull through. Nothing bad is really happening. You're just feeling depressed because you are used to achieving great thing, achieving things quickly. It's a hard environment. There is no doubt you will succeed and you will find the team you need, get the investment you need and build the company you have always wanted. You have chosen to put yourself in a challenging situation. If it wasn't challenging, you wouldn't feel as satisfied when you get to the end goal. So I think that it's just important to know that everyone who's starting out on an entrepreneurial journey or even many years down the track, there's always hard times. There's always times where you don't know whether things are going to work out or not, but you just keep on persisting. Um, I sat down with Bill, it was on University Avenue, University Cafe, and I sat down and I was super like nervous. Right. I would, actually was terrified and sat down and was like, okay, like trying to eat my lunch. I'd read that if you mimic someone's body language, they like you more. And he had his... Is that right? Apparently, apparently. Wow. Bill's empathy. I think it's called mirroring. Mirroring, yeah. And so he... But he was sitting there with his, like, arm behind his chair. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to try and sit with my arm behind my chair. And he was very unattentive. He did, didn't seem to be interested at all. He was on his phone. And I was <laughs> oh like, my oh, my God, this is the worst thing ever. I have completely flopped. And... Um, but I went back... And he'd messaged me and he said that um, he'd be happy to invest if I could find a tech team. And so he'd also introduced me to Lars Rasmussen who co-founded Google Maps. And I met up with him the next day and I chatted to him for hours and we realized like there was a lot of alignment in like what we believed the future of communication would be like. Um, and he was really happy to help find a tech team. But what this actually entailed was just me trying to bring every single engineer I met um, on LinkedIn, met on the bus, just like yeah. literally any anyone I would, that would possibly join my tech team and him rejecting them just time and time and time again. And it was incredibly frustrating because this went on for a whole year of him just being like, nope, <laughs> like this person's not good enough. You've got a really hard technical project. You need to have someone amazing that's like wow. built a huge scalable platform before. And like, that was really frustrating because I wanted to get started on the future of publishing. But then eventually after a year, ended up finding our amazing co-founder Cameron Adams and our CTO Dave Herndon um, and eventually got to work. They forced you to find a tech team. Yeah. And they were right. They were. Actually, I'm, I'm really, truly grateful for that pain. The number one rule of investing is to never underestimate anyone, including the 22-year-old from Perth who is printing yearbooks in her living room. <laughs> but what that shows is that you're dogged and you're resilient and you're willing to do whatever it takes. So why take on such epic challenges if it's going to be so damn hard? Well, I think because it's fun. I think that some people are just wired to want to take on challenges. If something's challenging, that's the thing that I want to do in general. And also the ability to build something world changing, to be able to have an impact, that's pretty damn cool too. Here's an 85 year old's perspective. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from an 85 year old in a nursing home. And she writes, if I had my time, 
If I had my life to live over, I dare to make more mistakes next time. I'd relax, I would limber up. I'd be sillier than I've been this trip. I would take fewer things seriously. I would take more chances. I would eat more ice cream and less beans. I would perhaps have more actual troubles, but fewer imaginary ones. So I think what's so awesome about this poem is that if you make every decision in your life based on what would I like to have done in my life looking back, what legacy would I like to leave, what crazy adventures are worth going on because it's going to be a great story in the end, then it sort of gives you a pretty cool slant to view the world. But I think the PowerPoint as well, like people used to be stuck with publisher and yeah. clip art and yeah. heinous font. So I guess the, yeah. I guess a lot of people who had previously be, had previously used Microsoft that uh, we are now using Canva. Oh. Um, and then also for designers, like designers have this other huge pain point. They usually have to send a PDF backwards and forwards and like, hey, can you change this tiny little yeah. typo? And so the idea is that they can create templates on Canva that the rest of the organization can then use. Yeah. So we kind of will hope to replace PDF as a form of collaboration. Yeah. Um, I just saw so many people struggling to learn like where are the buttons like how to actually create something yeah. but then it's not just the tool that you have to learn you then have to go and purchase photos from a stock photography library and then go to a font library and a template yeah. library and collaborate over email and go backwards and forwards many times getting all the content from people then you can design then you have to prepare it for web or print and I'm like we thought this was completely ridiculous right. and it was all desktop based and thought that it should be online and collaborative so the, the broad concept is that it's completely free to use so the mm -hmm. idea is that regardless of your income regardless of where you are in the world you can use Canva and like create awesome presentations and pitch decks and marketing materials. Um, but then if you want to increase your productivity, you can pay. And then when you do that, it's called Canva Pro. We just rebranded it last week. And yeah, it's um, $12.95 and you get access to all this amazing stuff. The whole point is like, it's really like, we want to give as much value as we possibly can. Like when we launched, um, Photoshop was $1,500. Like who can afford that? Especially not students and everyone else. So we wanted right. to make sure it was accessible. One of our um, philosophies was click minimization. So the idea is trying to like ensure you have the least number of clicks to get the maximum amount of value or to move you towards your goal as quickly as possible. And so if you look at the number of clicks that would previously be required to create a presentation and going to all these different libraries and all these different content places and collaboration, um, compared to what it requires, what what's um, what you can do in Canva is pretty phenomenal. I think, like, I guess right from the start, we really set out to solve a really significant pain point. Like having seen, firstly, when I was teaching design programs and then with Fusion, like see, really seeing the pain points that people were having, um, really seeing the power of having this online collaborative platform. Um, and then just being really true to that. So having, be, you know, even as we were starting our small business with the first company, yeah. um, like trying to get a brochure and getting quoted $1,500 when we didn't have $1,500 to like make a brochure. No. Um, and so I think just being really focused on the customer's pain point and what they're trying to do um, has been pretty powerful. But then I've been just blown away by our community. So we've got 150,000 YouTube videos have been made about Canva. People are tweeting about it. They're having their own Facebook groups with you know tens of thousands of people, like just giving each other tips and workshops yeah. and like and for all sorts of niche industries. So like there's YouTube videos about Canva for YouTube thumbnails and for beekeepers and for dentists oh. and in all sorts of languages. I see all the time job ads going up saying either like Canva's a required skill or oh, wow. on the inverse people are putting it on their resume. And then even on Upwork, there's people that are advertising like Canva as a specialty. That's mind blowing. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool to see. When you're faced with a wall of rejection, what do you do? You have two options. You can stop, probably like most sane people, or you can persist over and over and over again until eventually, eventually you land investment. That's what we did. But what was so incredibly exciting was that as a result of all of this, we started to build the team of incredible software engineers and designers to actually start to build Canva. And after another year of development, we're very excited to finally launch Canva. It's been a long time in the making at this point. And so we're actually able to combine that entire design ecosystem and make it really simple for people to design. It was incredibly exciting and incredibly rewarding to finally get it out into the world. And very excitingly, we started to grow like crazy. And so eight months in, we had over 350,000 designs created per month. 
We couldn't believe it. Every single month was growing much more rapidly than the month before. And we were like, wow, this is actually working. We weren't just crazy. And then, now, we have over 9 million designs created per month. And it was pretty impressive even to us. We've got over 10 million users from 179 countries across the globe. And this is our awesome team. We've got now over 100 people in our team. But when you hear these numbers, even to me, 9 million just seems like a crazy number. I can't even comprehend that. But when you hear one of the stories, so we've had a sheriff in the US who's creating wanted posters with Canva, and we've had all sorts of crazy things being created. Charities using Canva to raise money for their, fun, for their charity. Small businesses using Canva to get their business off the ground. Um, and so much community love, it just completely warms our heart. This is what our team has been doing this entire thing for, is to help people create incredible designs and to do things they didn't even know was possible. But that, of course, is my highlight reel. What you read in TechCrunch is, of course, companies' highlights. What you're reading in the press anywhere is people's highlights. Even when I'm trying to articulate how challenging it is to start a company, it's the highlights. And so it's so important to realise this. If you're starting out on an entrepreneurial journey, if you're trying to achieve anything, this is one of my favourite quotes for that very reason. The reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Isn't this true? It's so important to know that every single entrepreneur is going through struggles. It's, really, it's a really challenging journey to get to where they are. And what you read is, of course, the parts that are highlighted, the parts that are in people's highlights reel, where I actually think the funny thing is, that the things that we, I deserve the most congratulations for is when things are really hard and challenging. When we're hitting great user numbers, it's very, you know, very happy times, it's great to celebrate those things. But the things that entrepreneurs really need celebration is for those challenging times, that struggle. The first article that was written about Canva, yeah. like so we'd been, so it'd been sort of like five years in the making, like, you know, between all of the pitching investors and getting rejected hundreds of times and all of this stuff. Yeah. And then finally we launched in 2013 and, and a journalist broke the embargo and said Wonderful. that Canva wasn't the best, like they, they wrote quite a critical article and were like, oh no. And they were like, your stock photography is cheesy. It's a really simple tool. And they weren't saying very nice things at all. And it felt like my whole world had just crushed down. And I was like quite sad at that point in time. From there, things picked up fortunately and th things have started to grow rapidly. Like when all the other press came out, they were much more complimentary. Wow. And then the community started to get on board and we were getting interest from across the globe. And since then, it's just been growing phenomenally quickly. So yeah. we now have um, 15 million monthly active users in 190 countries. We're used in like 80% of Fortune 500 companies. Like just, it's growing pretty rapidly. I should show you some of our charts. It's quite funny. It's just a pretty nice looking exponential pointy curve. Just like it's, it's been just been growing really consistently for now five years. I really like just searching for the word Canva and seeing what our community has to say. I, I do that quite regularly. Um, so I think every every company is unique in how yeah. it should work together. So we have a lot of engineers. I think we've got about 250 or three, no, a lot of engineers. Yeah. And then we have a lot of product designers and um, graphic designers and um, copywriters and product managers and data analysts and yeah, the full, the full swag. So we're in 190 countries now. Mm. We've had about 200 translators across the globe translating. Wow. Um, and last year we launched in China and we really, we've set up a team there and really had to localize very heavily there, um, including moving servers and everything over there to do it properly. Um, we also launched, the other hard languages we were sort of leaving towards the end was launching in Arabic and Hebrew and Urdu, all the um, right to left languages. So yeah, we launched in that last year after a lot of customer demand. And so it's pretty exciting to see just how broadly across the globe Canvas being used now. No, we've set up a full team there. Um, yeah. We hired some amazing people to, to move there. Uh, and we moved a bunch of people from Sydney over there. Wow. Um, and we've really invested like with local partners. So the biggest stock photography and font company there uh, became partners. We did a big media um, conference and had heaps of journalists and yeah, Do really went all in there. Yeah, we're in we're in Japan as well. Yeah, I mean it's critical to localize the product, and then we've partnered with a um, KDDI, which is a really large telco there, yeah. and it's been growing really quickly there too.
what I thought I'd do right now is ten, share with you 10 very practical tips for doing something awesome. The first, every single person going to a business meeting, the first thing that you do is shake someone's hand. And you don't normally get a lesson in life on how to shake somebody's hand. In fact, it's something that you probably will never get told if you have an absolutely terrible handshake and destroy every single business meeting going forward. So what we're going to do right now is exactly that. We're gonna have a lesson on shaking people's hands. So this is how you start every investor meeting, every time you meet a new staff member, every time you are talking to a partner. This is the one lesson that you need to be able to perfect. So the second thing is quite an important one also. It's really important to find a problem that people care about. So if you are solving a problem that people care about, it's going to be your best marketing. Because all of a sudden, when you actually get to the point that you have your product and you're trying to market it, people care about it. So imagine if I had done um, all of those things, spent all of those years trying to start this company and then we launched the product and no one cared. One really great way to reassure yourself and make sure that doesn't happen is to solve a problem that people deeply care about because they're going to then care about your solution. Another really important thing to do is to start niche and then go wide. So when we started out, we had no business experience, etc. We had no experience but that was very relevant at all. Um, but what we did was start with school yearbooks in Australia, which meant that we could really solve the pain points for Australian schools and we could really have a problem, have a solution that solved their problems, which was fantastic. And then once we built all of that experience, we were then able to take it and try and solve lots more problems of the entire design ecosystem. Another really great thing is to create a strong vision and a plan to get there. What you do want to do is have an ideal vision, which is a crazy, crazy dream for what the future will look like, and then little, take little steps every day to get there. And so it's really important. Something that I think people don't do enough is dreaming. Just dreaming, what is the future of communications going to look like? What's the future of transport going to look like? What's the future of whatever industry it is going to look like? And when you start to really believe that, and when you get a really clear idea of what that looks like, and then you create a company in that, in that sort of swell, going along that path, then that really creates a great environment to create a company, and means that as the future goes forward, me, it's been nine years later, <laughs> it means the world will catch up to where you believe hopefully the, um, the future will be. And I think it's also really important to know that to succeed at anything takes many, many attempts. There is actually no one, I've never spoken to an entrepreneur that's had it easy, that things just worked out instantly for them. It just doesn't happen to anyone. The world is kind of set up and it's you know, got the companies in place that aren't really going to want you to succeed. And every single structure in the whole world is designed not for your company to succeed, but just to exist as it currently is. And so for you to succeed at something means that you're going to have to go against the grain and it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Another great thing is to seek excellence. Go to the epicenter, read great blogs. There's so much great knowledge available on the internet that you can just take for free and use that. Another really fun thing um, is to learn about yourself. As you are starting a company or taking on any endeavor, joining a startup, it's so important to know about yourself and to be able to utilize that information, to be able to make great decisions, to be able to build stronger relationships. Another really important thing is to not do it alone. But even before you have enough money to um, hire any staff, and even if you don't have a technical co-founder or an amazing um, other co-founder, it's important to um, hire people early on and to be able to outsource that work as quickly as possible. So you can use things like Upwork and Freelancer to get incredible people on board quickly um, and to help learn to be able to give out work to other people rather than trying to do it all yourself because it means that you can grow so much more quickly. Another really important thing that you may have gathered is that it's incredibly important to love challenges. That's the only thing that has been standard from the last nine years of having a business, is that there's constant challenges. In the first stages, it was the challenge to get the product started, to actually become profitable, otherwise we'd have no company because we had no investment, etc., etc. along the way. Now with 100 people, there's all sorts of different challenges that we need to um, deal with. But loving them is a really important aspect. It's also really important to find your own flavour. So if you read in the newspaper or you read on a blog or whatever you're reading, you hear about other companies and what they do. And you've all got the expectations of what a company is, but it's so important to find your own flavour and to not think that you have to do something because that's the way another company works. 
So the final step that I was going to explain is that it's really important just to take your first step. So you saw with that ladder, if you don't take your first step, you're never going to get there. You're just gonna have this crazy wild outland stream that you never achieve. <laughs> so it's really important to take the first step. This is a photo of me when I was 14, and this was my first business experience. So I made scarves, and I sold them to women's boutiques around Perth, um, but it was such an important and valuable learning experience for me, because it meant that I actually was able to create something of value, and was able to then actually sell that and market it. And um, it was really important, because it meant throughout my entire life, I've had this knowledge that it's possible. Well, we have a two-step plan. It's, a, it's very simple. Yeah. Step one, build one of the world's most valuable companies. Okay, great. And step two, do the most good we can do. We're not in a rush. I mean, we're yeah. profitable and we've got like quite an incredible number of investors. Like in the last round, we had General Catalyst join as That's well. Great. And um, Blackbird and Felicis, who have been long-time yeah. supporters. And so I think for us, there's certainly no rush and there's no mm -hmm. lack of capital. Um, and we're able to continue to invest really heavily in our long-term success. Um, so yeah, there's no rush. I've just always liked solving problems. And I all, like from quite a young age, I remember going to Bali for the first time and just seeing the complete inequity um, between like what I had as a child growing up, like with a good education and yeah. all the rest of it and seeing kids on the street and being like, OK, well, that's something that I would like to help solve at some point, which yeah. is why we had our two step plan. I feel like there's enough goodness in the world. There's enough goodwill. There's enough money to solve all of the problems in the world. We just need a little help to, to reorientate society a little. So my theory yeah, is that to right. solve the world's problems, yeah. we actually need governments and companies and non-profits and entrepreneurs and VCs and everyone to work together to yeah. reach the goals. So I think that like there needs to be a lot more collaboration and a lot yeah. more voice given to goals um, that we all have because we all want a better world. I think there's definitely a little more, um, there's room for improvement, yeah. I'd say that, across yeah. the globe to actually give goals of people more of a voice. And so we've got, we've got a few things in the works coming up. I think that I'd just give a couple of words, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And I think that I, yeah. along a lot of the journey, you just don't really know. You're kind of like just walking down a dark, dark tunnel and being like, I think this is the right way. And then you start having people behind you. And now we've got 600 people behind us. And it's like, I think this is the way. My tiny little candle in front of me is only yeah. burning a little over here, but I, yeah. I think that this is the direction. It's not a wall. <laughs> So. You just don't really know because it is a dark tunnel. <laughs> I think that that's one thing that's really critical as a founder is like we try to always undersell numbers. So we round down if we have a number. I think like it is really critical to make sure that truth is a very, very strict line in the sand and you, you don't ever cross that. You are needing to get people to understand your vision and what you're trying to do and achieve. But it's also it's critical for people to know where you are today and not to be shifty with that one. Yeah. I think one of the best things that you can possibly do is to put your heart and soul into every single thing that you're doing. And that's something that I did from very early on. I think I was just innate. Um, but if you really are trying hard, so if you're trying really hard in your subjects, if you're trying really hard in absolutely every single thing you're doing, extracurricular activities, it means what you're doing, not is just getting good grades, but you're learning that you can achieve. If you're putting hard work into things that you can actually, it pays off. Um, which is an incredibly valuable lesson because it means that you can then take on bigger and bigger challenges and have confidence in yourself that eventually you'll be able to see it through. The ironic thing is I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> so we'd had a company for several years, um, but we knew nothing about the whole world of startups and Silicon Valley and venture capital. So we just created this company that was in a little bubble for us. Um, we had a problem and we wanted to solve that problem. And 
it was annoying because when we went to um, the bank, we couldn't get a loan because we didn't have much of a credit history. Um, and then we met you and um, Bill, and it was an incredible um, learning curve for us. So I went, spent so much time over in Silicon Valley and just realising there was a whole world of people out there that were like us was yeah. pretty incredible. Doing. Today, I've been able to explain, and I hope that you've been able to deeply know that it's possible if you want it badly enough, and it's hard because it's certainly meant to be. Thank you.